Welcome to It's About Time, a classic technique for sharpening scalars and curettes. This method for sharpening scalars and curettes is based upon a teaching strategy designed and developed by Sherry Burns, author and creator of It's About Time, and educational consultant for Hugh Freedy Manufacturing Company. The modules contained in this presentation will guide the clinician through general principles necessary for instrument sharpening as well as demonstrate uh, its about time method of instrument sharpening. This approach to sharpening periodontal scalars and curettes will utilize the simple visual imagery of the hands of the clock to establish the correct positions for sharpening a stationary instrument with a moving stone. Why sharpen scalars and curettes? The objective of instrument sharpening is to restore a sharp cutting edge to the instrument blade while preserving the original shape of the blade. This presentation teaches a technique that uses the face of the clock as a guide for proper alignment of the instrument and sharpening stone. With practice, this technique will allow the clinician to consistently produce sharp edges on scalers and curettes. Dental clinicians know that sharp instruments are very effective for deposit removal. Repeated use of an instrument wears away particles of metal from the blade, causing the cutting edge to take on a rounded shape, resulting in a dull, ineffective edge that can slide over a deposit rather than removing it. With a dull blade, the clinician will need to apply greater pressure and use more strokes to remove deposit. An instrument with sharp edges will readily grip deposits. This will result in the clinician using less lateral pressure and fewer strokes to effectively remove deposits. The results of using dull scalers and curettes include inefficient deposit removal, lower quality work regardless of clinical skill, increased lateral pressure, reduced tactile sensitivity, increased clinician fatigue. When an instrument is dull, the tendency is to tighten the grasp in order to apply more pressure. In addition, more strokes are required for deposit removal. Taking the time to sharpen is important as sharp instruments provide many clinical benefits. Some of these benefits include improved calculus removal, reduced fatigue, improved tactile sensitivity, minimize patient discomfort, improved instrument function, Sharpening Stones Sharpening stones are used to restore the cutting edges on dull instruments. In order to produce consistent and accurate cutting edges, it is important to select the proper stone for the sharpening task. Sharpening stones are available in a variety of types and grits. Stones with coarse grits will grind away metal at a faster rate than those with a fine or medium grit. Sharpening stones generally are classified into three categories. Arkansas stones, India stones, and ceramic stones. Arkansas stones are frequently used to sharpen scalers and curettes. The Arkansas stone is a natural stone with a fine grit. The color of Arkansas stones can range from black to gray to a translucent white. When using an Arkansas stone, it is necessary to coat the stone with two or three drops of mineral grade oil. The oil will lubricate the stone and help float away metal shavings preventing shavings from becoming embedded in the stone. This helps ensure that the abrasive quality of the stone is retained. The buildup of oil and metal shavings that results from sharpening is called sludge. During sharpening, sludge should be periodically removed from the stone and instrument with gauze. Arkansas stones are available in flat, wedge, cylindrical, and conical shapes. The Arkansas stone is ideal for light recontouring and regular maintenance sharpening of scalers and curettes. India stones, sometimes called eye stones, are synthetic or man-made stones that are available in a variety of shapes and sizes. India stones are available in fine, medium, and coarse grits. India stones are often used to recondition worn instruments. Water or oil can be used to lubricate an India stone prior to sharpening. Since the India stone is a man-made stone, it does not build up sludge like the Arkansas stone. Instead, there will be a collection of metal filings that can be wiped away with gauze. Ceramic stones are the newest type of sharpening stones. These stones are available in a single grit stone 
or dual grit stone, whereby one side of the stone is a coarse grit and the other side consists of a medium or fine grit. Oil is not needed for lubrication on ceramic stones as they can be used dry or with water. This stone pictured here is a dual grit stone. The blue side is more abrasive and is used for reconditioning dull instruments, while the white side has a finer grit and is used for light maintenance sharpening. Regardless of the type of stone that is used for sharpening, it is important to properly care for the sharpening stone. After sharpening, wipe the stone with a gauze square to remove the sludge or metal filings from the surface of the stone. This should be done for all types of sharpening stones, including Arkansas, India, and ceramic stones. The sharpening stone should then be cleaned of additional debris by scrubbing with a brush or placing in an ultrasonic cleaner. After this cleaning, the stones can be sterilized in a baguette or an instrument cassette. Note that for instrument sharpening to be efficient, the proper stone should be selected for the task. Arkansas stones are used for light recontouring or regular maintenance sharpening. For instruments that are very dull, more abrasive stones such as eye stones or ceramic stones will be needed to create a sharp edge on the instrument. Sharpening Basics Whether sharpening sickle scalers or curettes, there are basic principles to consider prior to sharpening. These include instrument design, instrument grasp, stone grasp, assessment of instrument sharpness, the sharpening work area. The specific design of a scaler or curette will assist in determining the correct angles for sharpening. All dental instruments have a handle for grasping the instrument, a shank that connects the handle to the working end, Instrument shanks vary in design to allow adaptation to various tooth surfaces and a working end that consists of a blade with one or two cutting edges. The instrument shank can be further divided into two sections. The functional shank which extends from the handle to the beginning of the working end and the terminal shank which is the area of the instrument between the blade and the first bend of the shank. The terminal shank is a crucial feature of the instrument during sharpening procedures. It is the terminal shank of the instrument that must be properly aligned during instrument sharpening. Note that for a sickle scaler, such as the H67, the terminal shank is rounded. It extends from the blade and blends into the functional shank. For a Gracie 1314, the terminal shank extends from the blade to the first bend. Both of these shank types will be important when aligning the blade for sharpening. Whether sharpening scalers or curettes, the instrument grasp will be identical. In your non-dominant hand, hold the instrument vertically with a secure palm grasp. The blade to be sharpened should be at the bottom with the toe pointed toward you. Rest your thumb on the upper shank. This is very important as this will help stabilize the instrument when pressure is applied on the blade during sharpening. Resting your elbow on the table will also aid in maintaining stability during sharpening. The same stone grasp is used when sharpening either sickle scalers or curettes. The grasp should be on the lower half of the stone with the thumb on the edge toward you and fingers on the edge away from you. This stabilizes the stone and assists in maintaining a consistent vertical motion during sharpening. This will also minimize the tendency to move the stone with a rotating or rolling motion which may dull the end of the blade. Prior to sharpening, it is helpful to gather all necessary supplies. To begin, it is important that your work surface be flat. This will provide stability for your elbow during sharpening and allow you to view the instrument at eye level. A good light source and loops or magnification are vital in order to properly evaluate the edge of the blade. A sharpening stone that will best accomplish the task is required. It may be an Arkansas, India, or ceramic stone. Besides a flat stone, a cylindrical or conical stone may also be required. Cotton-tipped applicators, oil or water lubricant, gauze, and a plastic test stick will complete the sharpening work area. Assessing Instrument Sharpness The condition of the instrument blade should be evaluated both before and after sharpening. Before sharpening, the blade should be evaluated to determine the extent of dullness. 
Some instruments may require light sharpening, while others may need more reshaping and reconditioning. After sharpening, it is vital to evaluate whether the sharpening objectives have been accomplished. Two methods are available to determine the condition of the instrument blade, the visual inspection or glare test, and the plastic test stick. To visually inspect a blade, hold the instrument under a light and rotate the instrument until the edge is facing the light. A dull cutting edge will reflect light when it has become rounded from use. A sharp cutting edge will appear as a fine line that will not reflect light. It is helpful to use loops or a magnifying lens when inspecting instruments for signs of dullness. A hard acrylic or plastic test stick can also be used to determine the sharpness of the instrument. When the proper testing procedure is followed, a sharp blade will grab or bite the surface of the plastic test stick. The clinician will also hear a ping or metallic clicking sound. A dull blade will slide over the surface of the plastic test stick. It is important to note that the entire blade may not wear evenly. Some sections of the blade may be duller than other sections. For this reason, it is essential to assess the condition of the entire length of the blade. Sharpening Sickle Scalers Curved sickle scalers have two cutting edges. These cutting edges are formed by the junction of the facial surface of the blade with the two lateral surfaces. The two cutting edges converge at the end of the instrument to form a sharp pointed tip. The sickle scaler has an almost pointed back and the cross section view reveals a triangular shape. Straight sickle scalers, such as a jacket scaler, also have two cutting edges that come to a point at the tip of the blade. In both curved and straight sickle scalers, the facial surface of the blade is positioned at a 90 degree angle to the terminal shank. This is a key factor to note when positioning the blade and stone during sharpening. During sharpening, the cutting edges will be restored by grinding against the lateral surfaces of the blade. It is not recommended that the facial surface be sharpened as this can weaken the blade. When sharpening a sickle scaler, the entire length of the blade should be sharpened. This includes the heel, middle, and toe of the blade. When sharpening, the stone will be moved along the blade edge from the heel to the middle and finally to the toe of the blade. Before beginning the sharpening process for sickle scalers, assemble the required materials. A sturdy flat work surface with proper lighting is essential. The use of loops or magnifying lens is essential to clearly see the edges of the instrument blade. Also needed will be a flat sharpening stone, a cylindrical stone, oil or water for lubrication, depending on the type of stone, cotton-tipped applicator, gauze, an acrylic or plastic test stick. To prepare the Arkansas stone for sharpening, apply two or three drops of mineral grade oil onto the surface. Spread the oil on the stone with your cotton-tipped applicator. Hold the sickle scaler in your non-dominant hand with a secure palm grasp. Brace the top shank with your thumb and place your elbow directly in front of you on a flat or stable surface. This positioning of your thumb is very important as it will counterbalance the pressure that will be applied when sharpening the lower blade. Using the clock as a guide, hold the instrument vertically with the lower terminal shank positioned at 12 o'clock. The tip of the instrument should be pointed toward you. Place the lubricated side of the stone against the right lateral surface of the blade. Right-handed clinicians should initially place the stone at 12 o'clock and then tilt the top of the stone slightly away from the handle to approximately three minutes past 12 o'clock. Left-handed clinicians will tilt the stone to approximately three minutes before 12 o'clock. Initiate sharpening in a fluid up and down motion, starting at the heel third of the blade and slowly progress by moving the stone to the middle third and finally to the tip third. Maintain the stone in a continuous up and down motion using long strokes and moderate pressure. Finish on a downward stroke. To sharpen the opposite cutting edge, turn the instrument so that the tip is pointed away from you. Maintain the secure palm grasp and brace the top shank with your thumb, keeping your elbow on the table in front of you. Position the lower terminal shank at 12 o'clock. Position the lubricated stone upright at 12 o'clock. Right-handed clinicians should tilt the top of the stone slightly to three minutes past 12 o'clock. 
Left-handed clinicians will tilt the stone slightly to three minutes before 12 o'clock. Repeat the sharpening process starting at the heel third of the blade and progressing to the middle third and finally to the tip third of the blade. At this time, you may also want to use gauze to wipe the metal filings from the stone. To finish sharpening a curved sickle scaler, hold the blade at eye level with the terminal shank positioned at 12 o'clock. Place a cylindrical stone on the face of the blade with the stone positioned horizontally on the facial surface. Lightly roll the cylindrical stone along the face of the blade from the heel to the tip. This will remove any remaining wire edges. To finish sharpening a jacket scaler, position the instrument with the terminal shank at 12 o'clock and the tip pointed toward you. Lightly move a flat stone from side to side on the facial surface. To test the cutting edge with a plastic test stick, hold the test stick in your non-dominant hand between your thumb and index finger near the bottom of the stick. The position for the plastic test stick is 12 o'clock. Hold the instrument in your dominant hand with a modified pen grasp. Place your fulcrum on the right side of the test stick. Bring the instrument around the back of the test stick with a tip pointed toward you. Place the cutting edge to be tested against the left side of the test stick opposite your fulcrum. Tilt the terminal shank very slightly toward the test stick using the same angle you would use for scaling. Place the cutting edge laterally into the test stick and release. Test the entire length of the blade at the heel, middle, and tip. If the instrument is sharp, it will bite or grab the plastic test stick. You will also hear a metallic click or ping upon quick release. It is important not to shave the test stick as this will dull the blade. Sharpening Universal Curettes Universal Curettes, such as Langer, Columbia, and Barnhart Curettes, have two parallel cutting edges, which are formed by the junction of the facial surface with the two lateral surfaces. The two cutting edges meet at the end of the instrument to form a rounded toe. The undersurface of this blade is rounded, and the cross-section view reveals a semicircle blade shape. The facial surface of the blade of a universal curette is positioned at a 90 degree angle to the terminal shank. This is a key factor to remember when positioning the blade and stone during sharpening. When sharpening a universal curette, the cutting edges will be restored by grinding the stone against the lateral surfaces of the blade. Before beginning the sharpening process, assemble the required materials. A sturdy flat work surface with proper lighting is essential. The use of loops or magnifying lens is essential to clearly see the edges of the instrument blade. Also needed will be a flat sharpening stone, a cylindrical stone, oil or water for lubrication, depending on the type of stone, cotton-tipped applicator, gauze, a plastic test stick. To begin the sharpening process, hold the universal curette vertically in your non-dominant hand. The blade to be sharpened will be at the bottom with the toe pointed toward you. Brace the top shank with your thumb and place your elbow directly in front of you on the table. This positioning is very important as it will counterbalance the pressure that will be applied when sharpening the lower blade. Using the clock as a guide, hold the instrument vertically with the lower terminal shank positioned at 12 o'clock. Place the lubricated side of the stone against the right lateral surface of the blade. Initially place the stone at 12 o'clock. Right-handed clinicians should tilt the top of the stone slightly away from the handle to approximately three minutes past 12 o'clock. Left-handed clinicians will tilt the top of the stone to approximately three minutes before 12 o'clock. Initiate sharpening in a fluid up and down motion starting at the heel third of the blade and slowly progress by moving the stone to the middle third and then finally the toe third. Maintain a continuous up and down motion using long strokes and moderate pressure. Finish on a downward stroke. To sharpen the opposite cutting edge, rotate the instrument so that the toe is pointed away from you. Maintain the secure palm grasp and brace the top shank with your thumb with your elbow on the table in front of you. Position the lower terminal shank at 12 o'clock. Place the lubricated stone upright at 12 o'clock. Right-handed clinicians should tilt the top of the stone slightly to three minutes past 12 o'clock. 
left-handed clinicians should tilt the stone slightly towards three minutes before 12 o'clock. Repeat the sharpening process starting at the heel third and progressing to the middle third and finally to the tip third of the blade. To maintain the rounded shape of the curette toe, rotate the instrument handle so that the toe is pointed at 3 o'clock. Position the stone underneath the blade at 3 o'clock and tilt upward toward the 2 o'clock position. Move the stone in a consistent up and down motion, overlapping strokes and rotating around the toe to maintain the rounded shape. To finish sharpening a universal curette, hold the blade at eye level with the terminal shank at 12 o'clock with the toe pointed towards you. Position the cylindrical stone along the face of the instrument at 3 and 9 o'clock. With slight downward pressure, roll the stone along the face from the heel to toe, removing any wire edges. To test the cutting edge, hold a plastic test stick in your non-dominant hand between your thumb and index finger near the bottom of the stick. Hold the test stick upright at 12 o'clock. Hold the instrument in your dominant hand with a modified pen grasp. Place your fulcrum on the right side of the test stick near the middle of the stick. Bring the instrument around the back of the test stick with the toe pointed toward you. Place the cutting edge to be tested against the left side of the test stick, opposite your fulcrum. Tilt the terminal shank very slightly toward the test stick using the same angle you would use for scaling. Place the cutting edge laterally into the test stick and release. Test the entire length of the blade at the heel, middle, and toe. A sharp instrument edge will bite or grab the plastic test stick. You will also hear a metallic click or ping upon quick release. If the cutting edge slides over the side of the test stick, it may indicate that the blade is still dull. Gracie Curettes. Gracie Curettes differ from sickle scalers and universal curettes as the facial surface of the Gracie blade slants downward at a 70 degree angle, creating only one functional edge to be sharpened. This functional cutting edge is the lower edge of the Gracie curette. The undersurface of the Gracie blade is rounded and the cross section view reveals a tilted semicircle blade shape. Gracie instruments are pair designs with each blade identified by a number. Each double-ended Gracie has an odd and an even numbered blade. For example, a Gracie 1-2 has the number 1 blade on the one end and the number 2 blade on the other end. This blade number is important as it will help determine positioning of the blade during sharpening. It is important to note that the lower cutting edge of a Gracie curette can give the illusion that the blade is curved to one side. This is not correct. Close inspection shows that the lower cutting edge is parallel to the non-functional edge of the Gracie. It is just lower due to the 70 degree angle of the blade. This is important to remember in order to retain the original blade design when sharpening. Sharpening Gracie Curettes. The demonstration for sharpening a Gracie curette will be shown with a right-handed clinician. Left-handed clinicians can proceed by using reverse directions. To sharpen a Gracie curette, begin with the odd-numbered end of the curette. Hold the instrument vertically in your non-dominant hand with the toe pointed toward you. Use a firm palm grasp and brace the top shank of the instrument with your thumb. The cutting edge to be sharpened will be on the right side of the blade. Focus only on the terminal shank of the instrument, which is the section between the blade and the last bend in the shank. Tilt the terminal shank slightly to three minutes before 12 o'clock. Position the stone against the right lateral surface at 12 o'clock and tilt the top of the stone to approximately three minutes past 12 o'clock. Initiate sharpening in a consistent up and down motion starting at the heel third and continuing to the middle third and finally the toe third. It is important to remember that the blade of a Gracie curette is straight and not curved. When sharpening, do not rotate the stone as you move from the heel to the toe of the blade. Instead, proceed with sharpening in a straight line from the heel to toe as this will preserve the original blade design. To round the toe of the odd-numbered Gracie curette, maintain the terminal shank at 3 minutes before 12 o'clock 
slowly rotate the instrument handle so that the toe is directed at the 3 o'clock position. The face of the instrument should be parallel to the table surface. Position the stone at 3 o'clock and tilt the stone upward to the 2 o'clock position. Move the stone in a consistent motion, overlapping the strokes and rotating around the toe to maintain the rounded shape. Lastly, the facial surface can be finished. To do so, hold the terminal shank at 3 minutes before 12 o'clock with the toe pointed toward you. Position the cylindrical stone along the face of the blade horizontally at 3 and 9 o'clock. Lightly roll the stone along the face of the blade from heel to toe. Testing Gracie curettes for sharpness is extremely easy because the downward slope of the blade automatically positions the cutting edge at the correct position on the test stick. The position for the terminal shank of the Gracie curette and the test stick will both be at 12 o'clock. In your dominant hand, hold the instrument with a modified pen grasp. For odd-numbered working ends, the toe will be pointed toward you. Bring the instrument behind the test stick and place the cutting edge against the left side of the stick. Place your ring finger against the side of the test stick opposite the cutting edge to act as a fulcrum while testing. Press the cutting edge into the test stick and release. If the instrument is sharp, it will bite or grab the test stick. You will also hear a metallic sound or ping when the instrument is removed. Be sure to test the entire length of the blade. To sharpen the even-numbered end of the Gracie curette, hold the instrument vertically in your non-dominant hand with the toe pointed away from you. Use a firm palm grasp and brace the top shank of the instrument with your thumb. The cutting edge to be sharpened will be on the right side of the blade. Focus only on the terminal shank of the instrument, which is the section between the blade and the last bend in the shank. Tilt the terminal shank to 3 minutes before 12 o'clock. Position the stone against the right lateral surface at 12 o'clock and tilt the top of the stone to 3 minutes past 12 o'clock. Initiate sharpening in a consistent up and down motion starting at the heel third and continuing to the middle third and finally the toe third. It is important to remember that the blade of a Gracie curette is straight and not curved. When sharpening, do not rotate the stone as you move from the heel to the toe of the blade. Instead, sharpen the blade of the Gracie curette while proceeding in a straight line from heel to toe as this will preserve the original blade design. When rounding the toe of the even-numbered Gracie curette, rotate the instrument so that the toe is pointed at 3 o'clock. The face of the instrument should be parallel to the table surface. Position the stone underneath the blade at 3 o'clock and tilt the stone upward to the 2 o'clock position. Move the stone in a consistent motion, overlapping the strokes and rotating around the toe to maintain the rounded shape. To finish the facial surface of an even-numbered Gracie curette, hold the terminal shank at 3 minutes after 12 o'clock with the toe pointed toward you. Position the cylindrical stone along the face of the blade horizontally at 3 and 9 o'clock. Lightly roll the stone along the face of the blade from heel to toe. Testing Gracie curettes for sharpness is extremely easy because the downward slope of the blade automatically positions the cutting edge at the correct position on the test stick. The position for the terminal shank of the Gracie curette and the test stick will both be at 12 o'clock. In your dominant hand, hold the instrument with a modified pen grasp. For even-numbered working ends, the toe will be pointed away from you. Place the cutting edge against the left side of the stick. Place your ring finger against the side of the test stick opposite the cutting edge to act as a fulcrum while testing. Press the cutting edge into the test stick and release. If the instrument is sharp, it will bite or grab the test stick. You will also hear a metallic sound or ping when the instrument is removed. Be sure to test the entire length of the blade. Tips for effective sharpening. Sharpening, like hand scaling, is a skill where expertise is developed with practice. Frequently sharpening instruments will help ensure that this skill is developed quickly. However, even the best clinicians occasionally encounter difficulties sharpening. Some of the most common sharpening difficulties will be reviewed here. When sharpening, a secure palm grasp with the instrument held in the palm of the hand and the thumb near the top shank is necessary to counterbalance the pressure from the sharpening stone. 
When the pressure from the stone is not counterbalanced, the instrument can slip out of position. This will cause the sharpening angles to be incorrect and can result in an instrument that does not have sharp cutting edges. It is important to remember that the blade of the Gracie curette is straight and not curved. When sharpening, do not rotate the stone as you move from the heel to the toe of the blade. Instead, sharpen the blade of the Gracie curette while proceeding in a straight line from heel to toe as this will preserve the original blade design. It is essential that the proper stone is used to accomplish the sharpening task. Light routine sharpening can be accomplished with a stone that has a fine grit such as an Arkansas stone. Instruments that are very dull will first require sharpening with a coarser stone to establish an edge and are finished with a finer grit stone. Another common sharpening error is dragging or pulling the newly sharpened blade along the length of the test stick. Testing the blade on a plastic test stick will let the clinician evaluate the sharpness of the blade. However, it is essential to use the proper testing technique whereby the instrument edge bites or grabs the side of the test stick. Sliding the blade along the side of the plastic test stick can dull a newly sharpened blade. In the development of any skill, practice is necessary to perfect technique. As you practice this sharpening method and become more proficient at it, you will find that you will be able to quickly, easily, and accurately sharpen your scalers and curettes. Frequently sharpening your instruments will help you enjoy the many clinical benefits of scaling with instruments that are in top-notch condition.